We're going to dismiss our kids to head back to class at this point. So if kids, you want to make your way out for class time, uh, you can head that general direction. I want to uh, want to share with you a story that I was reminded of just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to basketball game. It's Christy Wolber, uh, and Christy is quite the basketball player. In fact, 20 years ago, she was the National Player of the Year at Kentucky Christian College, the best women's college basketball player in the nation at the Christian college level. Uh, she won multiple national titles at Kentucky Christian. She's quite the basketball player. And so I was sharing this story because I think it's actually about her. She doesn't remember it happening, but I'm 99% sure the story is about her from many, many years ago. When I was a high school student, I went to Summer in the Sun, grew up going there, and uh, one of the things we used to do at Summer in the Sun is they'd take their parking lot in front of one of their dormitories, and they'd set up about six full-length basketball courts. And in the afternoon during free time, guys would go out and we'd play pickup basketball. And you'd, at times, you'd have 30, 40, 50 guys out there running multiple games, playing basketball together. And what, what the memory I have is of a group of college girls who played on the KCC basketball team. It would have been summer of 1998. They come out and they ask if they can play with us. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around high school male athletes, but they can be, um, what's the word? Um, <sighs> chauvinistic, um, humble is not the word, um, a little arrogant. And so they start, they start talking like, I don't want the girls on my team. They can't play with us. I don't want to have to guard a girl. That's not, that's not fair that somebody has to play with it. And so they're like, 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 the girls don't belong on the court with them. The girls shouldn't play with them. And I'm just telling you, these three girls who were coming off back-to-back -back national championships absolutely humiliated these high school boys. I mean, they just, like, guys falling down, hitting shots in their face. They took the ball from them. They blocked them. They just absolutely embarrassed them for about an hour and a half. And anyone watching that game, anyone present, even me, 20 years later, cannot help but leave those girls owned the court that day. They were better than anyone else who was there, and it wasn't even close. And what got me thinking about that story this week is not that I just spent a week with Christy, but this idea that we're going we're gonna to spend some time walking through the book of Daniel very quickly together this morning. And that verse that we read in Daniel chapter 7 about the Son of Man being lifted and exalted and His kingdom knowing no bounds is in many ways the theme verse of the entire book of Daniel. Because every story that you read in the book of Daniel is really the answer to one simple question. Who's actually in charge? And you'll meet all these people like Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and the, the satraps and rulers who are supposed to be friends of Daniel's and Belshazzar who think they're in charge, who make orders and give decrees and tell people what's going to happen. And then at the end of the story, we discover the same truth. Nebuchadnezzar might have thought he was in charge, but God was really in charge all along. Belshazzar might have thought he had all the power, but God really had all the power all along. It's there in the visions and the dreams when you see these different kingdoms laid out and the kingdom of God is exalted as much greater, much higher than any other kingdom. And so if you were to read the book of Daniel, every story points to what we read in Daniel 7. That the, that the Ancient of Days and the one who looks like the Son of Man, their kingdom knows no end, their dominion knows no bounds. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look just at the three most common stories that we read in the book of Daniel. And I want to show you how they all point to that truth, to the authority and kingship of God and his son, Jesus. The first one is the one that we read in Daniel chapter 1. If you're not familiar with that story, basically the exiles, the royal elite of Israel, the young men who they think could one day be rulers, namely Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are taken to Babylon to be trained to become Babylonian leaders. Okay, they're going to learn about Babylonian religion. They're going to learn about Babylonian politics. They're going to eat Babylonian food. They're going to teach them to become Babylonian rulers. And so while they're there, they're supposed to eat the food from the king's table. And for whatever reason, Daniel and his friends decide that the food is unclean. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe it was meat that had been offered to idols. Maybe it was there's a lot of pork on the table. Maybe it wasn't prepared in a kosher way. But they decide that to eat that food would be to make them unclean. So they refuse to eat the food on the king's table. I'll let you read that for a moment. <laughs> Can't resist the first and last time teenage boys refused food. Um, and they ask, can we just have fruits and vegetables? Rather than have the meat and the, the wine and everything else, can we just have fruit and vegetables? 
And the officer who's in charge of them, the official appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, goes, if I just give you fruit and vegetables, you're going to look weak and sickly, and the, I'm going to get in so much trouble. I don't think I can do that. It'll cost me my life. And so Daniel and this official, they make a deal. Give me 10 days. Let me have water and fruit and vegetables for 10 days, and you give everybody else whatever they want to eat, and then see if my way is better. See if me honoring God, being faithful to God, is better than doing what Nebuchadnezzar said. And we know how the story ends, right? This is verse 15. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. Because of course they did. Because when you choose to honor God, when you choose to do what God says, when you choose to be faithful to God, that's always a better path than doing something else. Honoring God's commandments, honoring God's authority, honoring God's rules is always going to have a better result than doing things your way or the way someone else tells you to. Because God is the one who knows best. It reminded me of, you ever go on vacation to a new place? Go somewhere you've never been before, a new beach, go to the mountains, go to a new small town. And you get there and like you're getting ready to go out for dinner the first night and you're trying to decide, well, where should we eat? And you have all sorts of choices. You can go with the big billboard you saw on the interstate on your way in. You can hop on the internet. You can look up Yelp. And so what's, what are the five-star restaurants here that I can go to? Can I tell you what my favorite thing to do is? I love to ask the first local person I meet, where's the best place in town to eat? Like I will walk up to the guy that I'm paying at the gas station. You know, I like getting, getting a bottle of water and some chips for the rest of the drive. Go, hey, how long have you lived here? Oh, my whole life. Good. Where's the best place for breakfast in town? Okay, we'll go to a new store, a little gift shop, and I'll be buying gifts, and I'll ask the lady, hey, what's your favorite thing to do in town? Like, what's the one thing we shouldn't miss? Why? Because who knows better than the people who've lived there for 30 or 40 years? Who knows the best place to eat, the best attraction to see, the best place to go to the beach, the best... Who knows better than the people who've lived there their whole lives? And part of what Daniel is teaching us in Daniel chapter 1 is who knows better how we ought to live our lives than the one who gave them to us? Who knows better how we ought to live and act than the one who created us, than the one who's been around since before the dawn of time? Who advice is better to follow than his? Not Nebuchadnezzar's. Nebuchadnezzar might think he's in charge, but he's not. We flip ahead a couple chapters and we come to Daniel chapter 3. And we meet Rack, Shack, and Benny, right? From VeggieTales Day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for those of you who don't watch VeggieTales. And the story is a simple one. Nebuchadnezzar builds for himself a massive golden statue. Probably in his own image. Probably to look like him. And probably based on the dream that he had in Daniel chapter 2, where Babylon is compared to a golden part of a statue. And he gathers the great orchestra of the land. They've got lyres and they've got flutes and they've got harps. And he brings all the leaders of the area together and says, here's the deal. When you hear the music play, bow down and worship the idol. And so the music plays and everyone except for these three gentlemen, they bow down to worship the idol. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know God's law. They know that there should be no other God before Yahweh. They know that they should not worship a graven image. And so they refuse to participate. And Nebuchadnezzar is furious. And he calls him before him and says, listen, I'm going to make that fire right there as hot as I can possibly make it. And I'm going to throw you in there if you don't bow down. And they refuse to bow down. And so he pumps the fire as hot as it will go. So hot, the Bible tells us that the guys who put them in the fire die from just putting them in the fire. They get close enough to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. And they fall over dead from the heat just from that act. And yet Nebuchadnezzar watches the fire. And we know how the story ends, right? This is verse 24 in chapter 3. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. And he said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. And he exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Jesus shows up in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they leave completely unharmed. I thought I'd illustrate that for you this way. I brought a very, very simple object lesson today. A very fancy piece of wood that I bought from the scrap pile in my garage with some nails in it, right? There's a point in the story where Nebuchadnezzar looks at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says to them, if I throw you in the fire then what God will save you? That's his question to them. Because in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he has all the authority, and if he decides they're going to die, then there is no power in all the universe that could possibly rescue them. 
And so I picture what Nebuchadnezzar imagined was this. Once you drive a nail into a piece of wood, you ever try to grab it with your fingers and yank it back out? Ugh! You just end up hurting your fingers, right? I don't care. I don't, I've known some people in my life who've worked like in steel plants and stuff. We have like vice grips. I'm telling you, they couldn't grab a hold of a nail and yank it out of a piece of wood. But once it's in, it's there, right? So in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he thinks, once I put them in, once I decide that they're going to die, there's nothing they can do about it. There's no way it can come out. Of course, you and I all know the solution, right? How many times have you taken a nail out of a piece of wood? Thousands. All you do is grab a hammer. And my music stand's going to move on me. It pops right out, right? No big deal, no grunting, no hurt fingers, easy as pie. When you bring something that multiplies your force, this is called a fulcrum with a lever, multiplies your ability to pull, a little physics lesson for you there. When you bring something with power and apply it to the situation, suddenly it's not such a big deal, is it? And what Nebuchadnezzar learns is that he might have thought he had all the authority and power. He might have thought that once he made a decision, there was nothing that could be done to undo it. But he was unaware of the fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had access to power far greater than he could imagine. And so when they asked the question and they says, who will possibly save you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if I throw you in the fire, what God will save you then? They replied, Yahweh, our God, will save us from the fire. And even if he doesn't, we will be faithful to him. Because they knew who was really king. They knew who really had authority and power. And his name was not Nebuchadnezzar. Then we got into Daniel chapter 6, probably the most famous story in the book, right? Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel, by this point, has risen to a position of power, not in the Babylonian kingdom, but in the Persian kingdom. The Persians have conquered the Babylonians. And Darius is now king of the world, as far as people know. And so Darius really likes Daniel and has promoted him to a position of power. But many of Daniel's friends have become jealous of him. And so they convince Darius to pass a law that for the next 30 days, no one may pray to anyone other than Darius the king himself. Now, what's loaded into that law is this idea. Why would you ask anyone else for help? If you need something, Darius can do it for you. If you need rescuing, he will rescue you. If you need strength, he will give you strength. If you need help, he, that Darius is the source of everything you could possibly need. Why would you want to go anywhere else? That's what's embedded in this law, that Darius is the ultimate authority and power. And of course, Daniel, like his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he knows better. And so he immediately goes home and opens the window to his house and kneels in front of the window and prays to God. And they see him. And they grab him, and they throw him in the lion's den. And their problem with Daniel is done. They have tricked him. They have won. The law has done its work, except we know how that story ends. For when he, that's Darius, reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And then Daniel spoke with the king, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. They haven't hurt me, for I was found innocent before him. And also I have not committed a crime against you, my king. But even the lions then had no power when God decided to intervene. And what we read in Daniel, even in the stories we didn't read, is over and over and over again the same truth. Powerful earthly men, powerful earthly kingdoms, powerful earthly laws trying to exercise their authority, trying to assert that they are the dominant one, and God repeatedly going, no, 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 you don't understand. You're not really in charge here. And whether it is eating the food or facing the fiery furnace or Daniel in the lion's den or Nebuchadnezzar losing his mind or Belshazzar seeing a finger writing on the wall, over and over and over again we learn the same truth, that God's really in charge. There's a, an old joke about a police officer who showed up to a crime scene. The neighbor had heard a gunshot and had called and reported 911 and he was the first officer on the scene and so he calls into his dispatcher to report what has happened. And he says, listen, I arrived on the scene. There's a man lying in the middle of the kitchen floor. He's bleeding. His wife shot him. And the dispatcher goes, why does wife shoot him? Turns out that she had just mopped the floor and he had tracked dirt across her freshly mopped floor for the third time that day. And she'd had enough. And she had told him, and so she shot him. And the dispatcher said, so have you arrested the wife? And the officer said, not yet. And the dispatcher said, Why? And the officer said, the floor's still wet. 
That's a wise man. <laughs> he realized in that moment he might have the badge and he might have the title, but she had the shotgun. <laughs> and she still had control of the situation. What Daniel teaches us repeatedly is that no matter what situation you walk into, whether there are judges involved, politicians involved, laws involved, friends involved, your own ego involved, no matter what situation you walk into, that God is the king, that he is in control, that he is in charge in every single circumstance. Like my friends from KCC on the basketball court, like the woman in the kitchen with her shotgun, he has the power in every situation. Over the last several weeks, we've shared some videos that my friend Dan and I made for you that are kind of a spoken word that have taught the truth of covenant and fear and, and atonement. Uh, this week, I decided to go a different route. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite videos. It's been around for a long, long time. It's based on a sermon by a, a guy by the name of S.M. Lockridge. And S.M. Lockridge preached a sermon called That's My King. So it's going to have a little bit of the same feel, but it's a whole lot better than anything I'm capable of making. And it speaks a powerful truth about who Jesus is. And fittingly, I told Andrew, I, I didn't know this until this week. The guy's name, the reason, the reason he goes by S.M. Lockridge, his full name is Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. And so just as the original Shadrach and Meshach knew exactly who their king was, so does Mr. Lockridge. And here's a look at his video, That's My King. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. 
That's my key. Amen. I want to close this morning by reading to you Daniel 7 again, where we began. I want to read this picture of Jesus as the King of Kings reigning for all eternity. But I want to read it this time with a very clear, practical application in your mind's eye before we read the text. Because if we're going to declare that Jesus is king, it has a very tangible, practical effect on our life. And we could go into all sorts of applications, but I'm going to make it as simple as we can because we're not always the smartest folks. If he's king, then that means he's in charge of every single area of my life. And it means that when I have these desires to do things that I think are best, that I think this is the best way to live, this is the best way to act, this is the best course of action, and it does not line up with what God reveals in his word to be the way I ought to live, then it is my desires that are wrong, not his commands. It means that when I think I know better, when I think, you know what, the Bible says forgive your enemy, it says pray for those who persecute you, it says love your enemy, but man, this guy, he's got it coming. If you just knew the things he had said and the things he had done, and he deserves a taste of his own medicine, and I'm going to get even so he doesn't do that to anybody else. I'm going to teach him a lesson. God will really like it because I'm going to teach him a lesson, and then he won't do that to anybody else. Listen, it doesn't matter what you think is right. It doesn't matter what you think would go best. It doesn't matter how you feel. If he's your king, then you are obedient to what he commands you. And you're welcome to choose vengeance and wrath and teaching a lesson in your own path. God will let you make that choice. Just please don't pretend like he's your king while you're doing it. Because if you're going to do what you want to do, then he's not your king. You're your own king. And we can apply that truth to every area of your life. I know the Bible says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building others up. I know that slander and gossip and deceitfulness are wrong. But man, I just feel so much better when I get things off my chest. They'll just have to learn to deal with it. You're welcome to do that. God is gracious. He will allow you to choose whatever you want to choose. He will never force you to be obedient to him until Jesus comes again and you'll know for certain who's king. But until then, you may live however you want to. Take a look at our world. Plenty of people living however they want to live. Just don't pretend like Jesus is your king while you're doing it. Because if he is your king, you don't get to decide what's best for you. You don't get to decide what's right and what's wrong. You don't get to decide how you want to do things. If he's king, then I submit to him and to him alone. So if he conflicts with a, a political leader that I like, I choose Jesus over that leader. If he conflicts with a preacher that I like, I choose Jesus over that preacher. If he conflicts with a book that I really like, I choose Jesus over that book. If he conflicts with what I think is best, I choose Jesus over my own desires. To declare that Jesus is king is to bow down and worship and say, Jesus, I will do whatever you ask. You're in charge of every single moment of my life. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? Probably not. But does it mean that the desire of my heart is to bring him glory in every word that I speak and every action that I take and every relationship that I have and every decision that I make? It means I want everything to be about him. When I'm deciding how to fill my calendar, what do I say yes to and what do I say no to? What activities are important and what activities take away from him? When I decide how I'm going to talk, when I decide how I'm going to spend my money, when I decide all of those things, if he's king, then he's king. And the gospel story begins with fear and trembling. And it moves through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and the salvation that leads to a right relationship with God. But it ends with the recognition that God is on his throne, that Jesus is seated at his right hand, and that he reigns forever. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to read Daniel 7 again as kind of the beginning of a prayer time. And then when I'm done reading, the praise team is going to come up and we're going to sing a song called We Fall Down. We fall down and we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. It's a song of submission, a recognition that Jesus is the one who has authority and is worthy of worship. If you happen to be here for the first time and you need to make that decision, that I want Jesus to be not just Savior, but Lord, I'll be sitting right down there. I'd love to talk to you about it. If you're watching online at home and you want to know what it means to have Jesus as your Lord, send us a message, leave a comment. I'd love to have a conversation with you about what it means to make Jesus Lord. For many of us, I feel like it probably needs to be a prayer time. 
that you have areas of your life where he has not been Lord, where you have been doing what you want to do, what you think is best, rather than what you know God desires for your life. If that's that case, then let this be a prayer of recommitment. That today I fall down and declare that Jesus is king of every area of my life. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Let's read Daniel 7 as the beginning of our prayer. And then our praise team will come and sing with us. Daniel chapter 7 again, beginning in verse 13. I continued watching in the night visions. And I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. And he, Jesus, was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Father, in this moment we come and we fall down before you. We proclaim Jesus as the King of Kings, a glory and a kingdom and a dominion that will never pass away. Let this be the prayer of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.